Welcome. This week, we're continuing our exploration of winner-take-all politics, how Washington made the rich richer and turned its back on the middle class. If you missed our first installment, you'll find it at our website, BillMoyers.com. Now, this is only the second broadcast of our new series, yet we've already made our choice for the best headline of the month. Here it is. Citigroup replaces J.P. Morgan as White House Chief of Staff. Behind that headline is a tangled web. The new Chief of Staff is Jack Lew. He used to work for the giant banking conglomerate Citigroup. His predecessor as Chief of Staff is Bill Daly, who used to work at the giant banking conglomerate J.P. Morgan Chase. Daly was maestro of the bank's global lobbying and the chief liaison to the White House. Bill Daly replaced Obama's first Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel, who once worked for a Wall Street firm where he was paid a reported $18.5 million in less than three years. The new Chief of Staff, Jack Lew, comes from Obama's Office of Management and Budget, where he replaced Peter Orzak, who now works as Vice Chairman for Global Banking at the giant conglomerate Citigroup. Still following me? It's startling the number of high-ranking Obama officials who have spun through the revolving door between the White House and the sacred halls of investment banking. But remember, it was Bush and Cheney's cronies in big business who helped walk us right into the blast furnace of financial meltdown. Then they rushed to save the banks with taxpayer money. But of course, Bush and Cheney aren't the only ones to have a soft spot for financiers. Bankers seem to come and go pretty frequently at the White House. President Obama may call them fat cats and stir the rabble against them with populist rhetoric when it serves his purpose. But after the fiscal fiasco, he allowed the culprits to escape virtually scot-free. And when he's here in New York, he dines with them frequently and eagerly accepts their big contributions. Like his predecessors, Obama's administration has also provided the banks with billions of low-cost dollars they use for high-yielding investments to make big profits. It's a fact. The largest banks are actually bigger than they were when he took office and earn more in the first two and a half years of his term than they did during the entire eight years of the Bush administration. And get this, President Obama's new best friend, according to the New York Times, is Robert Wolf. They play golf, basketball, and they talk economics when Wolf is not raising money for the president's re-election campaign. Now, just who is Robert Wolf? Well, he's top dog at the U.S. branch of the giant Swiss bank UBS, the very bank that helped rich Americans evade taxes. Here, Senator Carl Levin describes some of the tricks used by UBS. Swiss bankers aided and abetted violations of U.S. tax law by traveling to this country with client code names, encrypted computers, counter surveillance training, and all the rest of it, to enable U.S. residents to hide assets and money in Swiss accounts. Quite a tangled web. One man who has strong views on all these cozy ties between Wall Street and Washington is David Stockman. In the 1970s, he was a young Republican congressman from Michigan and an early proponent of supply-side economics. Some call it trickle-down. You know the theory. If you cut taxes on the wealthy while cutting government, the economy will take off, money trickling down and creating millions of jobs. It was the centerpiece of Ronald Reagan's 1980 campaign for president. There is enough fat in the government in Washington that if it was rendered and made into soap, it would wash the world. Once in the Oval Office, President Reagan made David Stockman his budget director. When President Reagan gave me this job, he pointed to that budget, which is some thousands and thousands of pages long, and he said, go through it from top to bottom with a fine-tooth comb, and unless you can find a persuasive demonstration why funds must be spent, cut those budgets. Stockman helped Reagan usher in the largest tax cut in U.S. history, a cut that mainly favored the rich. But things didn't go exactly as they planned them. The economy sagged, and in 1982 and 84, Reagan and Stockman agreed to tax increases. In 1985, Stockman left government and wrote a book critical of his own years in power, 
the triumph, the politics, the inside story of the Reagan revolution. He then took his economic expertise to Wall Street and became an investment banker. Thirty years later, he's writing a new book with the working title, The Triumph of Crony Capitalism. Thank you for doing this. For I sat down with him to talk about how politics and high finance have turned our economy into a private club for members only. What do you mean by crony capitalism? Crony capitalism is about the aggressive and proactive use of political resources, lobbying, campaign contributions, uh, influence peddling of one type or another to gain something from the governmental process that wouldn't otherwise be achievable in the market. And as the time has progressed over the last two or three decades, I think it's gotten much worse. Money dominates politics. And as a result, we have neither capitalism or democracy. Uh, we have we some have? kind of, we have crony capitalism, which is the worst. It's not a free market. Uh, there isn't uh, risk-taking in the sense that if you succeed, you keep your rewards. If you fail, uh, you accept the consequences. Uh, look what the uh, bailout was in uh, 2008. Uh, there was clearly reckless speculative behavior going on for years on Wall Street. And then when the consequence finally came, uh, the uh, Treasury uh, stepped in and the Fed stepped in. Everything was bailed out and the game was restarted. And I think that was a huge mistake. You write, quote, during a few weeks in September and October 2008, American political democracy was fatally corrupted by a resounding display of expediency and raw power. Henceforth, the door would be wide open for the entire legion of Washington's K Street lobbies reinforced by the campaign libations prodigiously dispensed by their affiliated political action committees to relentlessly plunder the public purse. That's a pretty strong indictment. Yeah, and, uh, but on the other hand, I think you would have to say it was fair. Um, when you look at what came out of uh, 208, the only thing that came out of 208 was a stabilization of these giant uh, Wall Street banks. Uh, nothing came out of 208 that really helped uh, Main Street. Nothing came out of 208 that f addressed our fundamental problems that we've lost a huge uh, swath of our middle class jobs. Nothing came out of 208 that made financial discipline or fiscal discipline possible. It was uh, justified as sort of expediency. We need to do this. We need to stop the cont contagion. But it wasn't thought through as to what the long-term implications of this would be. How did you see it playing out? I think there was a lot of panic going on in the Treasury Department. I call it the Blackberry Panic. They were all looking at their Blackberries. They could see the price of Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley dropping by the hour. And somehow they thought that was a thermostat telling them that the economy was coming unraveled. I don't believe that was right. I think what was going on was simply a huge correction that was overdue on Wall Street. The big leveraged hedge funds on Wall Street that called themselves investment banks were really investment banks. They were just big trading operations using uh, 30, 40 uh, to 1 leverage. And it was that that was being corrected. But they used the occasion of uh, the Wall Street banking crisis to create the impression that this was the beginning uh, of a uh, kind of black hole the, the whole economy was going to uh, drop into. I, I think that was wrong. And it was that fear that led Congress to do anything uh, they, they wanted. You know, that Congress gave them a blank check. Not well, at first. Don't you remember? Congress yeah. first refused to approve the bailout, right? Yeah. And, and then, then the stock market dropped 600 points because uh, all of the speculators on Wall Street all of a sudden began to think, hey, they might let capitalism work. They might let the f rules of free, uh, the free market uh, function. And you mean so by letting was, them fail? Yes. If they and, let them fail? I think if they let them fail, it wouldn't have spread to the rest of the economy. There wouldn't have been another version of the Great Depression. There weren't going to be runs on the bank. We weren't going to have consumers lined up in St. Louis and Des Moines and elsewhere uh, worried about their bank. That's why we have deposit insurance, the FDIC. But it would have been a big lesson to the speculators 
that you're not going to be propped up and bailed out. You're not going to have the Fed as your friend. You're not going to have the Treasury with a lifeline. You're going to have to answer to the marketplace. And until we get that discipline back into our financial system, the banks are just going to continue to grow, continue to speculate, and find new ways uh, to make easy money uh, at the expense of the system. President Bush, he was still in office then, yes. he said, I have to suspend the rules of the free market in order to save the free market. You can't save free enterprise by suspending the rules just at the hour they're needed. The rules are needed when it comes time to take losses. <laughs> Gains are easy for people to realize. They're easy uh, for people uh, uh, to capture. It's the rules of the game are most necessary when the losses have to occur because mistakes have been made, errors have been made, speculation has gone too far.